Hello, it's John from the Christian Century, and I'm joined today by Austin Shelley, who has written a recent lectionary piece for our magazine about reading scripture as poetry. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, but first, uh, Austin, for those who don't know you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I have uh, four kids and a husband and four pets. <laughs> That's the most important thing. I feel like that that I'm called to that family as much as I am called to ministry. So, um, so that's a, a huge part of our lives. I'm currently, I'm one of the pastors at Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, and uh, I'm loving this congregation, the warmth and the generosity that they extend into the world. Oh, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I now live again in Pittsburgh, but we are meeting for the first time today. So hopefully we can be friends now. Um, but <laughs> so in, real coffee in person sometime. That's right. Yeah, we can have coffee in the same in the same room. Um, so this piece, uh, it starts off with some content from poet Billy Collins about the ways we might approach a text. We might read poetry a lot of different interesting ways that Collins paints pictures for us. But then also, on the other hand, we might tie a text down to a chair and try to torture a meaning out of it. And I'm curious if you could just tell us maybe a little more about what you what Collins is saying, how different ways we might approach reading texts. Sure. Uh, I first heard this poem when Billy Collins read it at Princeton Theological Seminary. He came for an evening lecture and he he read this poem and i thought wow that's it um i was an english major uh back in the day and uh so i've always enjoyed poetry and and always loved that nuance i do think though that maybe english majors and preachers are the only people who really like metaphors and um so so anyhow i but i so appreciate the way that um he gives a few images about how he would hope that his students would read um, would read a poem. Uh, you know, he says that he wants them to hold it up to the light like a color slide um, or to drop a mouse into the poem and 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 observe as the mouse uh, finds its way out. And I'm not looking at his poem in front of me, but those are those are the uh, paraphrases of his images. Um, at one point, he says he wants his students to water ski across the surface of the poem and wave to the author on the shore. And um, oh, I just love how playful and fanciful those images are. And yet I do believe we've been taught to read poetry, maybe in that high school English or college English class, or um, or we've been taught to study scripture, uh, to tie it to the chair instead, um, to beat a confession out of it to see what it really means. Um, and that's the, that's really the emphasis that Collins is trying to make is that that's, that's the way we've been taught to come at these things, but he really wants us to uh, back up and experience the poem in a way that is delightful um, instead of uh, grueling every time. So I love taking that and then applying it to scripture. So much of our scripture really is poetry, <laughs> right? Um, the Gospel of John, parts of it are, and uh, the prologue certainly, um, and then parts of it are prose, but I think even that prose is super poetic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could give us an example of, for the parts of scripture or the parts of John's gospel that are not explicitly poetic verse, they are written more like prose, but they are poetic nonetheless. What might it look like to engage a part of scripture more as poetry, even if the text is not is not poetry per se. Yeah, so I think you know in this in this particular text in John ten, Jesus is talking about uh, you know being being the the gatekeeper, right? Being being the uh, the shepherd, and I that's that's a that's a metaphor, right? So it's like these are these are. Uh, literary uh, devices um, Jesus is using to uh, talk about an image that that people in uh, his uh, first century world would have would have readily known and I think the thing is that we have some time and space away from those images most of us do anyhow I grew up on a farm so I get some of the pastoral stuff but but not all of it um, 
because of the difference in uh, context, but I, I think that uh, so much of scripture is poetic. Um, parables are poetic. Um, the Psalms are certainly easily poetic, uh, a lot of wisdom literature, but some of it that's written, even consider Paul's letters, Romans 5, um, is poetic uh, and, and has all of this imagery and um, simile and metaphor and uh, synecdoche and just all of the things that um, you may have learned and forgotten from, <laughs> from a college English course. But but if we were to look at look at the Bible, not only as literature in that way, as poetry, but even in a um, in a devotional way, that way, right? Um, poetry gets at the heart of something that we can't always explain. Kind of like um, music uh, is poetry, and so I, I think about like God gave us music that we might pray without words, right? Um, and I think that's the that's what's happening here too, uh, in some of the scripture that is prose by definition, but that has lots of poetic elements to it. Mm. Uh, I mentioned to you before we started recording, my church has a discussion group where we actually discussed this article that you wrote. And okay. one of the, one of the group members actually looked up this passage in John in the first nations version, and it was formatted in poetic verse. It was in stanzas. And so she thought that was really cool. And then another group member started taking other English translations of this text and just putting it into a more poetic looking format and just shifting the format to look like verses. Suddenly the reading felt different. It felt more like a heart level, like the repetitions of different lines were hitting people more deeply. So I thought that was, that was a really cool exercise that they did. Sure. I love looking at this. Um, uh, this is going to sound more nerdy than I actually am. Um, but I love looking at biblical texts in their original languages because sometimes we miss the poetry uh, because of the translation, right? So um, I think about uh, just the Hebrew of Job um, is it is some of the most beautiful poetry in all of the canon of Holy Scripture that we hold, and yet we miss that in the English translation. We aren't we aren't getting the um, the tones and the sounds that. Uh, the repetitive sounds that are coming um, in the Hebrew, or in this case, in the Greek, we're we're missing some of those things um, by just having it having it in translation. I recognize that's not um, totally accessible to everyone, but I think at whatever level you can get at this, um, just simply as you said, by putting it into into versification format. Um, yeah, that that makes us tilt our heads a little differently. Maybe we're maybe we're doing what um, when your people did that they were doing what Billy Collins was hoping for, right? They were they were dropping a mouse into that poem and and watching it find its way out. Oh yeah, yeah. I think of all the images you quoted from that poem. I think dropping a mouse in is my favorite one. Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, okay, the last thing I wanted to ask you about near the end of the of the essay, you suggested that um, maybe the reason John's gospel is more poetic than the other three we have in the New Testament. Maybe it has something to do with the passage of time between the events and the, the writing down of the gospel. I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit more about that idea. Sure. I mean, most biblical scholars will say that John is written far later, right? Um, than certainly than Mark and, and much later than even Matthew and Luke. And so I think the gospel writer has been living with the spirit of Jesus most of his life. He's been living with the Holy Spirit, and that's how he encounters Jesus. Um, a, a mentor of mine, uh, gosh, I think he was in his 80s when um, before I went to seminary, so that was a while back. Uh, he said that he had a woman in his um, in a Bible study once who had not grown up in the church. She had uh, never gotten the sort of cafeteria style pulling from each gospel, you know, kind of together um, week after week. And so her first experience of reading through the gospels was a disciples Bible study um, that took, you know, one, like, like reading through the gospels one at a time. And when they got to John last, when she came in to the Bible study, she said, I don't know who this John guy is, but he didn't know Jesus. 
because her experience, her whole experience of gospel and good news for all people was that Jesus is the hidden Messiah. He's telling people not to tell anybody when he heals them, right? And then suddenly in John, here he is saying, I am the bread of life. I am the vine. You are the branches. I am the good shepherd, right? <laughs> like all of these I am statements hearkening, you know, back to I am who I am, or I, I will be who I will be, right? So just fundamental stuff of, of faith. And she just said, this is not the same guy. And, and I think that her perspective in not having grown up getting little pieces and parts of all the gospels kind of together meant that she could see that difference. And for a while, I think that, that I had a lot of trouble with the gospel of John. I still have some issues around, um, John's, uh, use of the Jews. And I've, I've seen you guys at the century of, have, have addressed that uh, beautifully as has Amy Jill Levine. Um, but, but now I think the only problem is that the gospel writer puts those words in Jesus's mouth. <laughs> Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the vine and the, you know, and the good shepherd. And so I think all of that is true. The gospel writer's experience of, of that truth really has to do more with his experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit um, than his experience, perhaps, of Jesus of Nazareth, um, where we get a much, uh, you know, a much more uh, newspaper-esque uh, reading of of the historical Jesus in, in the Synoptic Gospels. So I'm, and now I've come to love this, right? Because I've come to love the gospel of John because that's also my experience of Jesus. <laughs> you know, I think we could learn from that, that this is, this is how we experience Jesus. These things are true about him. And I, so I appreciate that we have uh, such a wealth and depth of, of resources there. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that part of your essay made me think about um, the relationship between the composition of a text and, and what is in the content, like um, the spirit at work over decades. And then I was thinking about, you know, some people think that this, like many books are more written by committee than like by a single author. Right. And so I started to think about though, the spirit at work in a whole community of people over decades and the, the discernment that happens as a community. And I just thought that was cool to think about that affecting how the gospel turned out as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this has been a lovely chat. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy we got to meet and talk about this essay. Um, anyone who missed this, there will be a link in the video description below where you can read Austin's essay. Um, thank you so much for chatting today. Thank you so much, Sean. I really appreciate the opportunity. Blessings.